Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Delia Anderson and I'll be talking to you today about the germination and growth response of Bohemian knotweed to red and far red light applications. This research was conducted in conjunction with Trinity Western University in Agriculture Canada, alongside my fellow researchers, David Clements, Jitchell Bay, and Ryan Critchley. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from the unceded ancestral territory of the Semiamu First Nation. What is Bohemian knotweed? Knotweeds are considered one of the world's worst invasives as a group. However, Bohemian knotweed is a hybrid of giant and Japanese knotweeds, which were invasive species that came from the Pacific Northwest and were already successful. Japanese knotweed in North America is assumed to be a male sterile clone and doesn't produce pollen. However, it does produce viable seeds, which can germinate if pollinated by either giant or Bohemian knotweed. This results in an increasing genetic diversity of multiple knotweed species that are considered invasive in the area. However, these species are largely clonal and they spread by rhizome and fragmentation. These rhizomes can go underground up to eight meters and outwards up to 20, making the spread quite expansive. We do see high seed production in the plants. However, few seedlings are observed around the frontal stands. Knotweed is not without its impacts, starting with the ecological. This plant grows rapidly and forms monospecific stands, crowding out and overshadowing native competitors. It inhabits riparians, disturbed areas, and open areas, and has evidence of allelopathy as few plants are found under its canopy, not even those shade tolerant species that we would expect to see. The species is also hard to control and eradicate, referring back to that rhizomal spread. A lot of the times an excavator can be needed for full removal of the species, and therefore control methods are constantly being researched. The economic impacts of knotweed are also pretty expansive with infrastructure damage due to the strong rhizomes having the potential to crack concrete. In the UK, property values are already being reduced due to the presence of knotweed on or around the property. There's also the cost that goes to government and NGOs, which are already spread thin with the number of invasive species that we have in the Vancouver and expanded area. There are also the social impacts of the knotweed invasion. BC has a lively outdoor wilderness culture and Vancouver and the surrounding area are well known for its ecotourism and natural landscapes. There's a potential for more econ economic impact within this if the natural landscape is too altered to harbor tourism. There's also the impact on indigenous communities as these nations have a historical connection to the natural landscape. Invasives could result in the displacement of culturally important species as well as the degradation of the cultural landscape of indigenous peoples. You can see in the lower left hand corner a photo of a woman from the Cowichan Nation binding reeds together that just displays the interconnectedness of indigenous culture and the natural world. We chose to investigate red and far red light, as in other species, germination rate was affected by the light ratios. In Man Eupidia, seedlings of other species had increased shade tolerance responses to these light ratios, which prompted the question. How would Bohemian knotweed germinate and grow under red and far red light ratios? Now we'll dive a little bit more into the methodology of this experiment. Seeds were collected at three different locations in the Fraser Valley BC that were geographically separated. The growth chambers were separated into red and far red light applications of 0.3 dense canopy, 0.6 moderate canopy, and 1.0 full sunlight. For germination, 600 seeds were taken from each location Four trays of 25 seeds were placed into each light application. These were germinated for seven days, and this part of the experiment was repeated twice. For seedling growth, seeds were germinated in more favorable conditions, and then four seedlings from each location were placed into each light application. The duration was 28 days for growth, and this was repeated four times. Unfortunately, in seedling growth replications three and four, there was great seedling mortality, likely due to a combination of equipment and user error. These replications were therefore excluded from the further statistical analyses. Here on screen are some images of the experimental setup. On the left hand side, you have the gradient of light applications of 0.3 to 1.0. And on the right, we have the seed germination experiment ongoing with a red and far red sensor placed inside to monitor the light ratios. The results of this study showed a significant difference in between germination by site and by red and far red ratio, with the seeds in the 0.3 light ratio having a 50% germination 
and those in 0.6 and 1.0 having an identical germination of 61%. In this graphic, you can see the difference in between both sites and those red and far red light ratios. For seedling growth, there was a significant difference in between height and site as analyzed through the Kruskal Wallace rank sum. Post hoc tests show that the difference was in between sites one and two and one and three. Mass showed a significant difference in between red, red and far red light ratios, once again being analyzed through the Kruskal Wallace rank sum test with a p value less than 0.01. Post hoc tests showed that the difference was in between the 0.3 light ratios and the other two, with a p value of less than 0.01 for both. Chlorophyll also showed significant difference in between red and far red light ratios as analyzed by ANOVA. Post hoc tests displayed that once again, the difference was in between the 0.3 light ratio and the other two, with the strongest significant difference being in between 0.3 and 1.0. Germination varies in between the sites, which is something that's to be expected due to the genetic variability of not wheat stands. Dense canopy at red and far red light conditions at 0.3 reduce germination rates by 11%, suggesting that light quality may act as a signal for germination. Yet this 50% still allows for germination in low light quality. Mass had sizable differences in between the red and far red light ratios. We saw a 381% increase from 0.3 to 0.6 and a 339% increase from 0.3 to 1.0. It's worth noting here that the greatest mass was achieved in the moderate red and far red light ratios of 0.6. Chlorophyll had a lesser increase, but still increased from 24% from 0.3 to 0.6 and 28% from 0.3 to 1.0. In conclusion, dense canopy conditions appear to inhibit germination. This is supported by the unpublished data of Vanessa Jones that showed a reduction in seed germination in total darkness. Reductions in mass and chlorophyll at the 0.3 red and far red light ratio may display bohemian knotweed's inability to succeed in low light quality. Unpublished data by Virginia Ogerly found that light quantity also inhibited seedling growth. This means that quantity and quality of light received could work synergistically to impede the growth of bohemian knotweed, which in terms of invasive species is great news. I would like to end by acknowledging Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada NSERC and Trinity Western University for their support during this experiment, as well as my research team that you can see pictured from left to right, that is Maria Goncharova, myself, Virginia Ogerly, and Vanessa Jones, who were mentioned in reference to their unpublished data. And lastly, I would like to thank you all for viewing my seminar. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>